Welcome. Welcome to the closing panel of this symposium on restoring public trust here at the Thomas Mann House in Pacific Palisades. Um, my name is Helmut Anheyer. I'm a professor at UCLA's Luskin School of Public Affairs and also a professor at the Hertie School of Governance in Berlin. And I also have the honor uh, to be a member of the Local Advisory Board. And it's my great, great pleasure to chair this uh, session uh, today. We have four of the Thomas Mann Fellows with us today. And let me introduce them uh, to you. First, we have Christine Landfried. She's a professor emerita at Hamburg University. She's a political scientist and legal scholar. Sitting next to her is Sunhild Kleingärtner. She's a professor of maritime history and archaeology and a director of the German Maritime Museum. Opposite her across is Andreas Nietzsche. He's a computer scientist and works on democrat democratic self-organization and is the co-founder of an organization called Liquid Feedback Project. And last not but least, we have Klaus Piers, a professor of history and epistemology of media. He's the director of the Center for Digital Culture at Lofana University in Germany. We have a very, very interesting panel. It's a very diverse panel. When you look at their perspectives, they are at the crossroads of different disciplines. They have, um, you might say, crossed national and professional borders. In the case of Christine, it is law, history and political science. And Soonhild, it's history, archaeology, and now being a museum director. For Klaus, you started as an engineer mm -hmm. and uh, then graduated to art history and philosophy. And Andreas, computer science, and you moved into the intersection of uh, the way I see it, sociology and political science in a very applied way. So we uh, do have these diverse experiences and perspectives. And I think what we're interested in uh, to hear from the panelists, um, uh, looking back over the last few days where we examined the question of restoring public <coughs> trust, uh, what were for you the main takeaways? What were new insights that you gained? And what made you say, oh, I have to follow up on this and I have to give this some more thought. That's a useful idea that had not come to me in the past. And it's always uh, difficult to be the first to be asked when with such a difficult question, but I think, uh, Christina, may I pass the word to you? Thank you very much, Helmut. Well, uh, looking back, uh, the presentations we had and having uh, the pleasure of listening to many different perspectives. Um, I was really, what I will take away um, was from the first session uh, when it was the question about cultural institutions and what they can contribute to trust. Um, what Sunhild Kleingärtner um, said that we have trust in museums and perhaps we should really use it for society strategically. And she had an example, which I was really surprised. I would have never thought of, and I will take this away. She said, why in the pandemic didn't we use the trust people have in museums uh, to have schooling in museums instead of homeschooling, having all these difficulties for women suddenly having to stay at mm -hmm. home, you know, mm -hmm. it was very unjust again for women. They had the main workload of the situation. And why didn't we go to museums? People like to go there. Uh, it's a really a quiet place. So I think this was the one really aspect I would have never thought of. Uh, and uh, I will really take with me away. And uh, the other uh, really interesting, which was perhaps not such a surprise, but which m made me think, uh, was when it was about uh, security uh, institutions, security systems. And then we had uh, Gren Melon, uh, the director here of uh, the General Public Library in Los Angeles. 
And she said, we should much more often take risk when we try new things. And this is true. We are so used, you know, in everyday business, uh, be it as teachers, as researchers. Uh, so I think this is also our chance here at the Thomas Mann House to be in a different situation, to have this historic background and, you know, being able to sit in this library, uh, which is, of course, also fascinating, but it takes us out of the usual everyday business. And when she said, take a risk, and you know, you try new forms of participation, of citizens' participation. This might be okay, but it might be a failure. Why not? A failure is a mm. failure, you make it better. So she said, you don't put reforms on a shelf, like you put books on a shelf, but you would sort of take risks. And I think uh, this is something for me, which I will also remember and be more conscious about taking risks. Very interesting. Uh, you talked about museums. Um, from a museum perspective, what did uh, you, you take with you? From, mm, uh, perhaps let me say two different things. Mm -hmm. One personal issue and then the professional one. Because um, I think we can thank uh, the jury uh, of the Thomas Mann uh, Fellowship Program that they trust in us, uh, that they trust in us as the researchers mm -hmm. and that they trust in our uh, research pro uh, projects. And it's really great to be here, to sit here in the Thomas Mann House and, um, as you said, to uh, be out of your own context and living together and knowing from each other and um, learning from the others means uh, to build up trust and um, all my uh, guys here are kind of uh, studying objects for me and <laughs> <laughs> I am one for them uh, because we can uh, learn living together what is trust and uh, perhaps I can uh, say uh, one example. Andreas, he is a computer uh, scientist and um, he has a lot of knowledge about electronic uh, voting. I'm not an expert on this, mm -hmm. really not. Uh, but uh, because I'm, uh, I trust him and he's a trustworthy uh, person, um, I trust in what he says and uh, what he explains uh, to me. I trust in his openness, I trust in his transparency and his mm -hmm. goodwill. And this is the personal level I take with me. And if you are asking uh, what is my profession uh, or the, the professional um, takeaway message, then for me, um, there is perhaps uh, one, uh, we should not only try to foster trust in institutions, but we should try to foster um, trust between institutions. Uh, a bit what you said, um, for me, it's, um, or this means uh, to build uh, new relationships of uh, trust between public institutions based on new forms of um, partnerships. Mm -hmm. um, so perhaps we have to consider as a, con a society about what are, are our tasks and what do we need for kind of institutions in order to fulfill uh, these tasks, uh, because institutions uh, should um, do a service to society and all we need is um, trust. And um, as you said, the discussion uh, um, with the lawyer, with the librarian, with the uh, journalist about the police, I think it was uh, quite interesting because we learned that uh, the police is doing a lot of things uh, they actually do not have to do, social work, and um, they care for homeless people and so on. And on the other side, the librarian uh, said the same thing, uh, that the uh, library here in the US uh, yeah, takes care for homeless people and uh, they do social work. And um, I'm wondering what we can learn um, in combining institutions in different way as we used to do it, um, yeah, in order to, to find the, um, the, 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 the tasks and the, 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 the right um, institutions for that. So my take home message is we should not only try to foster uh, trust in one institution, but we uh, should try to foster trust between institutions. Mm -hmm. So break down the institutional silos mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, that, right. uh, that we have. Um, yeah. So breaking, um, taking risks, breaking down institutional silos mm -hmm. um, are two takeaways. Um, 
Andreas, you you were mentioned. Uh, for, for <laughs> yeah, but, but first, for, Sorry, uh, thank for you for mentioning me. Actually. No, thank you. Thank, uh, congratulations to the Thomas Mann House uh, for this uh, wonderful, uh, diverse uh, program capturing so many aspects of uh, trust. And of course, thank you for uh, the opportunity to to be for being part of it. Um, yeah, I, actually, I, I was. Um, I was impressed by, by the variety of aspects it can have. Uh, I clearly, uh, uh, um, I also um, picked up this, this uh, element of uh, museums were considered entertainment rather than educational, mm -hmm. educational facility, which is uh, obviously uh, not a good judgment. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> yeah, when it comes to trust, I think we uh, very often, during these days, we have seen trust as something um, from citizens towards the government or towards institutions. I think we also need to see it the other way around. And it, mm -hmm. it came up today briefly, very implicitly, um, that, that also politicians sometimes don't have trust in citizens, which in turn sometimes uh, has to do with the perception of social media and experiences they make with social media mm -hmm. and the toxic effect. And then they try not to, um, not to engage with citizens, or they they have they are hesitant to do it. Let's put it this way. And once they do it, this has a reinforcing effect because we are entering a vicious circle yeah. of mistrust. And uh, yeah, and there we have to break out. And and during the days we have seen uh, various uh, uh, ways and various initiatives which can be a solution. The citizen assemblies. Um, but also the individual uh, activities, which are sometimes done by activists. Activists play an important role. At the same time, I see that um, many of the solutions we need to do, we, we need to offer, uh, shouldn't be partisan. We need bipartisan approaches uh, to overcome uh, uh, the, the problems we have in, in this polarized society. And uh, also, I'm very happy to to. Uh, um, be able to talk with Klaus in the coming uh, uh, months, um, because media is a, is a very important uh, thing. With, which, which, uh, uh, with what I'm thinking about a lot, because uh, wh when you actually want to do deliberation, you need mm -hmm. um, you need a certain you need certain information, and the media usually doesn't cover it. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. The media looks for celebrity and crime and, and interesting stories to attract attention. This is not necessarily what you need for deliberation. And it, of course, it has to do with what the audience wants to see and wants to hear and wants to read. Um, but probably we, we need to find ways to, to get beyond that. Mm -hmm. I think the session that was probably closest to, to your field um, was the one uh, chaired by Craig Calhoun with uh, uh, Larry, Larry Diamond and uh, Professor Fishkin from, and of course, Christine. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, uh, now, uh, looking back, what, uh, how do you, what did you take away from that session? I, I, I like this session very much. Um, what they were talking about was uh, actually uh, telling the people who were selected in the sortition process and prepare them for a deliberation. Mm -hmm. um, this will. This is definitely. I will give you that. Uh, uh, good for reaching good solution or good uh, good uh, results in that in this deliberation. But we need to look beyond that. We also have to think about what do people think who were not selected uh, in that sortition mm -hmm. process. How, what effect will it have on on society? And um, therefore, I think we, we need to enable the whole society to engage in, in such deliberations or we, we, yeah we we need to uh, create an understanding my favorite example for the united states is uh, by the uh, multilateralism uh, which uh, the whole political class uh, bought into i mean until recently some years ago mm -hmm. uh, at least um, but uh, they never cared about communicating this to the general public and the result is that this population became vulnerable to populism in this particular aspect because you could say, oh, we don't want to care about the world, now America first. And uh, so this, um, this is probably something the media has to do. And Thomas Jefferson 
was notorious for uh, detesting the media in his time. Mm -hmm. And uh, nevertheless, he was quoted as saying when he was asked if he would prefer uh, a government uh, without uh, newspapers or mm -hmm. newspapers with the government, he wouldn't hesitate to choose the latter. And this shows uh, this is, <clears throat> this is um, this shows that criticizing the media can be an, an acknowledgement of importance, but with great importance comes great responsibility, and that's why I think we need uh, to to demand more from the uh, media. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think some people would would say that. Uh, uh, America turned inward um, uh, away from multilateralism because America did not take care of itself for a very long time. So we had a, uh, a serious policy neglect when it came to uh, the deindustrialization de period in the 1970s and 80s, which then overlapped with globalization. But um, um, the, the diagnosis of why we ended up in this um, situation here, we have a divided society divided publics. Um, I think we're getting closer to that. We know what, what went wrong. Um, but we need a media, of course, to help us get out of it to some extent. And uh, I'd like to turn to Klaus and uh, share his thoughts to us. And uh, I think the media were also implicated in what Andreas just said. Right. Oh, actually, yes. And first, I have to uh, apologize because I only uh, arrived here Monday night, so I missed some parts of the, uh, or most of the conference. But nevertheless, uh, my reaction would be to answer in a kind of professional deformation. So the interesting <laughs> questions that were up for me were about history and media uh, yeah. that were raised during the conference. Um, and one impression was, this might be another professional deformation of playing the devil. Uh, one was that my impression was uh, that there uh, a loss of trust, which is, obvious, is stated or observed in the whole government, mm -hmm. obviously because it's the topic of the conference. But this also presupposes that there has been trust. Yeah. Trust is taken, in a way, is taken for granted. And then we're mourning the loss uh, of mm -hmm. trust that has been there in, in modernity. Uh, so what is told is, in a way, a history of losses or a genre of crisis mm -hmm. uh, or a narrative mm. of uh, urgency in a way to restore a trust. And I wonder from a, if that might be uh, thought the other way around, thinking about mistrust and has there ever been mm -hmm. trust in modernity. Uh, so for me, this would be an occasion, an opportunity mm -hmm. to rethink history and to think about the history of modernity in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think mistrust is, in a way, at the very core of modernity. Uh, it's fundamental. I mean, modernity in the 18th century, but it on the 18th century, and Enlightenment started as a mistrust in arcane politics, uh, in discrediting a s secret and mysteria of sovereign uh, uh, mm -hmm. politics. Mm -hmm and ended up uh, in a situation where the states distrust the citizens and the citizens distrust the states. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is something Kozelek already mm -hmm. observed uh, after World War II in Critique and Crisis, so the crisis in mistrust is the very core uh, of, of modernity. Mm -hmm. um, so, and looking back, this would be interesting for me, the mm -hmm. claims for restoring trust in contrast to a rewritten or differently written mm. history mm. of modernity and what kind of media play a role in that. Yeah. 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 Christine, then. Yes, I think it's a very uh, interesting point uh, mm. that Klaus is raising. Uh, but I would argue uh, that the mistrust at uh, what you say at the mm. beginning of modernity, so Reinhard Kieselek was my teacher, so oh. Oh. <laughs> you oh. can see <laughs> that I have read this dissertation several times. Uh, but this was a mistrust which was a critical mistrust. Yes. It was an informed mistrust. Mm. So yeah. it was a mistrust actually which wanted more of democracy and mm. not less. And nowadays the loss of trust we have is going away from the state, not being interested anymore, mm. not going to the elections. So I think there is a loss of trust and uh, the mistrust at the beginning of modernity perhaps is something else. Mm. Mm. That's interesting. We, uh, 
I mean, we uh, we have work by, uh, let's say, uh, Francis Fukuyama, uh, who wrote a book a few years ago on trust. And uh, his argument was that some societies have always been higher, more trusting um, mm -hmm. it, from an institutional perspective. And he, um, he mentioned Germany, he mentioned Japan, and, uh, uh, and others have been less trusting. Mm -hmm. And among them, the United States. So the United States always was, uh, when it comes to institutional trust, um, less trusting than mm. the, the European uh, counterparts. But I, I'd like to come back to the role of the media uh, in, from a historical perspective in American history. Because uh, if you compare the regulation of the media in, in Europe to the regulation of the media here, um, is it not true that America has always been very hesitant uh, to regulate media, much more hesitant than Germany or the European Union? Has. Think about the the wild days of um, newspaper journalism uh, in this country in the late 19th century. Think about uh, uh, Minow in his 1960s, uh, I think it was 1960 or 1962 speech, uh, where he looked at the state of television in America and he called it a wasteland, right? Um, and and compare that to Germany, where right, where we had uh, one or two television channels and they were still very much in the hand of uh, established interests. Right? So is it uh, the case that in the United States we tend to have a more free-floating um, way of dealing with institutions and taking into account that they might generate distrust in the population? Mm. Uh, Comparison of systems is more and less <laughs> topic, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry for ending this over. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, um, the, the, the American system uh, is probably more anemic. Um, it's um, the small exception of, of uh, publicly funded uh, uh, stations like NPR. Mm -hmm. um, you have uh, the driving force behind journalism in the United States is uh, profit. Uh, and that's the best case. Um, mm. the, could, there are also stations uh, which are definitely uh, which which have an ideological background, and they are certainly the greater danger, even mm. because um, maybe with the with the profit oriented sector, uh, there could be a change with, just with demand. So if um, mm -hmm. if citizens, if recipients, would mm -hmm. ask for other information for better prepared information. And basically you, you find it on you, you find it on the, on the media. You, you have um, things like the Global Public Square with Farid Zakaria. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Very good prepared for, for a topic every Sunday. Um, <clears throat> if people would ask for more of that, um, I don't think the, the mainstream media would, would be hesitant to deliver this. That they, they they have no ideological reasons not to deliver it, so they are in the moment they are just following um, the call of the market. Uh, that's mm. what might be my, my yeah. perception. And, and Germany <coughs> had the uh, Grundversorgungsparagraph, yeah. which mm -hmm. is. Some kind of basic provision is no equivalent in the US, I think. Uh, That's why the, 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 the nightly news basically mm -hmm. disappeared in this country, right? And mm -hmm. we still have yeah. it. So, mm -hmm. so this is some, yeah. that media is mm -hmm. essential. I mean, the Grundversorgungsparagraph, mm -hmm. yeah. before uh, uh, electronic media, it related to something like a cow or so. <laughs> if you mm -hmm. went bankrupt, yeah. go, yeah. go to jail, there's some basic provision that is left mm -hmm. to you. Mm -hmm. And you have a right to have mm -hmm. a radio, even in prison, and so on. Mm -hmm. This is media the Grundversorgung in Germany. And it's, Something mm -hmm. that happened but, after yeah. World War Two, and it had also underwent a crisis mm -hmm. with the with the internet and digital media. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And sort of for the audience, what uh, Andrea said uh, to be interested in real, uh, more interesting information, you must be educated mm -hmm. before. And mm -hmm. I think this is why one it's it's not about just the audience, but also what you offer. Uh, and in so far, I think uh, now nowadays these decisive question will be how to also perhaps regulate the social media. You know, it's uh, uh, you cannot sort of uh, the question is can you just leave this and going on? And uh, the trend has been so far 
uh, in the United States, for example, uh, that Facebook, that they make their own control and own mm -hmm. regulation. What is hate speech? What they, do we take out and what not? Mm -hmm. And the question is, can you leave this to the persons mm -hmm. who have the interest in earning money? Mm -hmm. uh, and this is why I think the question, what you are uh, asking about regulation of media, uh, has to be put in a really new way with these new media. It's not just about, well, like the, the channels we have in Germany, which are regulated, but now how can we regulate the social media? And the European Union tries to do that also for other media. Uh, where to pay taxes, all these mm -hmm. things. I think uh, this has really, uh, it's, it's a real uh, question for the future. Mm -hmm. But you see an interesting pattern, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, in the, before that, I was only referring to the established uh, mm. media outlets. Uh, and uh, yeah, but in journalism uh, reform circles, uh, there is this mandate of making the important interesting mm -hmm. and interest people, educate them, mm -hmm. uh, apart from what the schools do. Um, with social media, you are totally right. Um, this went the wrong way and it even became more problematic because those systems which were not designed for democracy mm -hmm. were used for mm -hmm. debates, were used to spread information and, and to, 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 to change the, uh, the, the public discourse um, with algorithms hidden from public view, with uh, creating polarization. Um, and uh, yes, what, what we need is, we need scientists to look at this and to create, let's say, benchmarks for algorithms uh, to really assess how harmful can be uh, certain algorithms um, if they are applied and, and this should be part of the regulation and I believe the European Union or, already funds um, uh, research on this um, to, to go to this on a structural way because um, it, many things sound very innocent but then when you do it at a large scale uh, it can have disastrous effects. Yes. Could I add uh, one aspect, because you mentioned that it's important uh, that there are regulations uh, concerning the content, but I think uh, perhaps one should um, take into account that there are um, paid ranges, so it's not only a question of the strongest argument, <laughs> if there are good mm -hmm. arguments, but it's a question of paying for a uh, range and um, so not the, the best argument uh, wins, but the, um, the, 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 the one uh, which can uh, pay for its range. That's, uh, um, yeah, leads to uh, uh, yeah, a, a different uh, way of using information and a uh, different way of spreading information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But here we have an interesting um, uh, pattern um, between Europe and the United States, right? so, um, in, in the EU, um, Germany as well, in particular. Um, if there is a, a problem, we, we try to regulate it. Right? Um, as in, that's a governance response. In, in the United States, it's, uh, it's not so much regulation. Uh, the, the preference would be, as we saw in the media, uh, always self-governance and litigation. Right? So you, you, uh, you have a, a very combative, you might say, uh, approach to solving uh, problems. It typically ends up being somewhat of a modeling through. Um, but um, do, you, do you think that uh, the EU and uh, the United States will go about restoring public trust uh, in the context of media in very, very different ways? You probably would say yes, right? They already are, right? Maybe. I mean, yeah. I mean, Keeping in mind that the media, of course, don't stop yeah. at national borders. Right? Yeah. So, social I media. Mean, and that might also relate to Andreas. Uh, I mean, no one news when, uh, when new media appears. Yeah. When in early modern times, uh, diplomatic correspondents switched to letters, mm -hmm. from orality mm -hmm. to letters, uh, this was thought of as a medium of trust. Yeah, it's the written letter, mm -hmm. there's this rhetoric uh, form of, mm -hmm. of the diplomatic note and the diplomatie which secures that you can trust in the letter. And mm -hmm. also at the same time the letter became uh, 
the very source of mistrust. Yeah? Uh, there had to be guarantees that you can trust the letter, a seal, or what the messenger is wearing when he carries the letter, etc. Et mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, so media always at the same time produce trust and mistrust. Mm -hmm. and it's hard to foresee what this will, what will happen with social media if it's yeah, yeah. considering the algorithms or so, mm. and also what part the technology uh, itself plays. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, I mean, this whole these homophilic uh, recommender yeah. systems, yeah. and so they're exactly based on prediction. Mm. They're machines built yeah. for prediction, so they always produce mm. the same in a way, which is. And I try to save the Koselec argument, yes. which yes. is the complete opposite so, of the open future. Okay. This is the yes. closed future, yeah. presenting people with their own thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. And the question is, what can we change on a software mm -hmm. level, or is it built in the very technology of the system that come from mm -hmm. cybernetics and from yeah, focusing on an enemy and predicting enemy behavior? Mm -hmm. And we are, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and, Please and, come to us. Yeah. And also the question is, will we just, is the technology mm. who is driving us into the future or do we want mm. to shape it? You know, just saying mm. the technology will do it mm. uh, and then the people who are earning money with it, uh, which has been the case in mm. the last uh, decades uh, with all these uh, big uh, machines, uh, Google, mm. Facebook and so on. So I think uh, this is the question to bring it back. Mm. Uh, either you regulate or whatever you do, or if you have boards, you can also make it from the society. There are self-governance mm. forms also. It must not always be regulation from above. Uh, but uh, it can't be, in my view, that technology just decides where we are going with the media. Mm. That's a very interesting observation. Um, and let me share one that um, uh, occurred to me just uh, yesterday. I, um, I as you, as you know, I teach at, at UCLA um, a large group of undergraduates and the topic of the seminar is, or the lecture course, it's uh, the great questions of our times. So we look at what is the future of democracy, what is the future of citizenship, and, and, uh, and what is the future of American society. And, and we identify certain factors that are, in the eyes of the students, very, very important that we should consider. And the usual factors come up, but what has been coming up ever more in the last uh, few years is technology. Sure. And, uh, and this, this student generation, and, and I don't know how representative they are, it's the first student generation that I encountered in many decades of teaching that, is, uh, that has questions about technology. Oh. And, uh, and they do not trust technology anymore. Right? Mm -hmm. and, so, mm -hmm. and I was wondering, in the context of what we're talking about yeah. here, uh, what do we do with a generation that no longer trusts the technology they are going to live with? Right? <laughs> Is it similar to uh, our generation? We did not trust nuclear power. Mm -hmm. But they do not trust artificial intelligence. They do not trust social media. Mm -hmm. right? It's um, a healthy development. Do you think it's a healthy development? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a healthy development. Mm -hmm. Of course, what you said, with recommendations, with targeted apps. Mm -hmm. this, is, yeah. um, this is a new quality. This is a new quality because silently you can polarize a society and you can change the outcome of elections uh, under certain circumstances when, when you change the public opinion mm -hmm. because you target people. You, you increase all the effects of homophily, polarization, um, and, and people uh, learn more reasons to, 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 to stay in their own group and, and, to, and to see everything mm -hmm. as tribal identity. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's absolutely, and it's not built into the technology, but it's, uh, it's about how the technology is used. And that's why I said we need for deliberation, for instance, we need systems explicitly made for democracy. And when it comes to social media, to general mm -hmm. social media, which also has nice effects, um, we need, what I mentioned before, benchmarks for the algorithms and to allow the use of certain algorithms because just looking for the further engagement for the sake of keeping the people longer on the platform um, at the price of democracy, uh, this price would be too high. And, and so we, we cannot allow this to happen. 
And when the students already start thinking about this, I think that's a healthy development. So we say the students should distrust um, or have less faith in technology, but uh, develop more faith in democracy. And, and yeah, and and understand more what is technology and what what technology brings about, because there are mm. many ways of. I mean, the keyword was AI. Yeah. Uh, so you don't need. AI for many things, uh, and in particular, you don't want to have intransparent uh, AI output and, and AI uh, decisions. Um, you can, you, sh you should, you need, that's an ethical question and really has to be assessed by, by the appropriate uh, scientists and um, what should AI do and mm -hmm. what should AI not do. If AI can, um, can prevent an accident on the street, um, I don't see an ethical problem. If an AI decides what people uh, learn, um, depending on their um, predeposition uh, uh, or, or on their political beliefs, mm -hmm. which the system already has analyzed, and then uh, having this deter deteriorating uh, uh, effects, uh, this is something we cannot allow to happen. Mm -hmm. I wanted to uh, go back to the, uh, a more fundamental question about trust. Um, and uh, Christine, uh, Anthony Giddens uh, once wrote that trust is a very fragile uh, commodity. And uh, once uh, trust is broken, it is very, very difficult to restore. Um, and others say that trust in modern societies is actually much more resilient. Mm -hmm. And you, it is less trust in an ontological sense, right? Mm -hmm. uh, either you trust your spouse or you don't, right? Mm -hmm. It's more like having varying levels of confidence. Um, mm -hmm. How do you come out on these views when it comes to trust and confidence? Can trust be restored? Well, if, uh, if I would take what, uh, what you had now from Anthony Giddens, is mm. it more trust, more fragile, or is it sort of mm. more stable? I would say it is fragile. Uh, and we can observe this in society, because uh, um, it, it is fragile and uh, it takes a time before we realize uh, that trust has broken. You know, this is also typical for fragile uh, things that, you know, uh, first you don't see, but then once you realize that what we now start to realize in all the public debates, uh, it's very late and it's very difficult to restore it. And uh, I think uh, the trust is really starting in a society, in a democratic society between citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you have uh, indicators that trust between citizens uh, is going back, so I think this is really even more bad uh, than to have to lose trust in institutions. Uh, so if both comes together and uh, uh, obviously studies show uh, that what we observe with globalization, this tremendous inequality between rich and poor, uh, that this has consequences for the trust between persons uh, and not just the trust into institutions. And I think here we can see it's a very fragile moment. Mm -hmm. So it's a very fragile characteristic uh, trust. And this is why it's important, uh, even if it's now late, uh, to have to think about how can we, yeah, well, re-strengthen that trust. Mm -hmm. the, um, there are sociological studies on how to, um, or what are correlates or predictors of, of trust. And uh, you're familiar with this famous question. Uh, can people generally be trusted or uh, you cannot be too careful, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and what explains then the variation uh, is, um, is, is education. Mm -hmm. So the more educated you are, the more trusting you become. And um, the extent to which you engage in civil society institutions. So if you put both together, it's uh, the accumulation of successful encounters with others. Right? And that's why uh, stratification, uh, trust as a phenomenon in modern society is highly stratified. Right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're trusting people mm -hmm. right? that if you um, 
go to parts of LA with a lot of poverty and mm -hmm. where we have in exclusion would be the same in Berlin. That's where the tr distrust mm -hmm. is. And, uh, and I think from a policy perspective, um, the, the message seems quite clear, right? That we need trust generating uh, institutions uh, doing their job. And uh, museums mm -hmm. um, are uh, trusted institutions. Mm -hmm. what, what do you make, what do you think? Why, what makes museums so mm -hmm. trustworthy? So yeah. what you've said, uh, I think um, a certain part of society is especially interested in museums. So it co correlates uh, with you've said, mm. what you've said. But um, there are uh, different studies. Uh, the um, American Association of Museums uh, has recently published uh, a new one. And um, I think um, competence is one of the main factors. So about 50% of the people who has been asked um, said competence is very uh, uh, important and um, research-based facts. So not fakes, but mm -hmm. facts and this research-based. And uh, what I think is uh, very interesting that I think about 35 or 6 percent of the people uh, said um, museums are neutral places. And I'm <laughs> very interested uh, if um, in my talks with the museum's directors, mm -hmm. which I will have in the following weeks, uh, if um, the leaders of the museums agree to this, because actually Every museum wants to be uh, to, to have a political agenda and not only to be a neutral um, place without any message. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm very much uh, interested uh, not only um, to know about um, the visitor's perspective uh, according to the study, uh, but to learn from the um, director's and leadership perspective mm -hmm. um, if uh, this is the way they uh, try to um, uh, yeah, uh, they, they want to promote uh, their museums and uh, I guess um, there are several leaders who do not have um, um, thought about trust as a, in a strategic way. Mm -hmm. So mm. uh, in the museums you are doing a lot of trust uh, worthy things but I don't think that the category um, trust is um, a, a strategic element. Uh, it, it's not part of the mission of, right. of a museum, mm, yeah. but, uh, so it's implicit. Yeah. Yeah. So what it P perhaps more in the US than in Germany, I think. Uh, and uh, the, the studies I refer to, they are from the US okay. and not from Germany. So uh, there is no, well, I do not know any trust study uh, related to museums from Germany. Yeah, I'd like, um, to come back to, the, in the few minutes that we have left, uh, back to the uh, issue of democracy. And um, uh, we, we are all aware that uh, we have um, serious challenges when it comes to our uh, liberal order. Uh, and uh, what is always discussed or comes up a lot are, in fact, what was uh, uh, the subject of the debate uh, of the panel uh, chaired by Craig Calhoun. Um, kind of citizen engagement form or kind of self-organization of, of citizens and forms of deliberation. Um, and one, one issue that always uh, seems to pop up then is, uh, uh, yes, they seem to work under certain circumstances, and we heard that in the panel, but what about uh, the scaling up of it? Um, what about the people not participating? Um, what about the communication aspect that comes with it, that you have to uh, include those not being included. Perhaps, uh, and Andreas, have you thought about this? And, yeah, yes, and of course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, um, I wouldn't argue that everyone has to be involved in civic participation. Um, because in a, in a representative system, that would be the wrong matrix. Um, because it's totally okay not to participate and trust the politicians. But I think everyone should have the chance to participate. So everyone mm -hmm. should have the opportunity. So the aim is not 
involving everyone, but giving everyone the opportunity to do it. So that's the first thing. And then again, um, the uh, citizen assemblies, for yeah. instance, and many other formats are restricted by definition, but they have their benefits, they have their advantages. And we, we should, I, I, I think this was also said on the panel before, we should definitely follow many paths and do many things because society has many levels and so we should do things in parallel. When it comes to scaling up, there was today, the, the, the scaling up was discussed in the context of video conferences. Um, what was not covered was the field I'm working in, it's asynchronous text-based deliberation. Uh, many people shy away from this because this looks from at first sight like social media, but it isn't because it's, uh, it's designed to be a credible process with equal rights for everyone and uh, encouraging constructive contributions. And in, in our case with mm -hmm. the liquid feedback project, it is designed to scaling up to a, now I say, <laughs> I would say it, uh, mm -hmm. to a potentially unlimited number of participants. Um, this being said, we have done it successfully with 10,000 people several times, but um, we are, um, and we believe it would work if we scale up one or two dimensions. But going from 10,000 to 100,000 or 1 million mm -hmm. uh, creates questions because sociolo uh, sociologists say um, more is different. So we don't, we don't know exactly what happens. Will there be effects we didn't think of? And that's why um, we really need to work with sociologists, uh, political psychologists, political uh, um, uh, political scientists. And social choice and yeah. political mm -hmm. scientists, of course, and, mm -hmm. but also with social, yeah, um, to, to find out in formal models, but also in uh, empirical studies what we would have to expect and how we could recalibrate if mm -hmm. need be. So we don't know if those effects will happen. And if they happen, we don't know if they will be bad. They could be, uh, actually, they, they, they could be favorable. <laughs> yeah. So um, we, uh, but yeah, I think this is one of the important ways. Nonetheless, all the other ways are, uh, uh, should totally be, be followed. And uh, this variety is what is democracy, and we are not. Uh, we we don't want to have a monoculture, um, mm. and yeah. So that would be my take on this. Mm. It's very interesting. Yeah. So there are many many options to advance mm. uh, this particular approach. Um, perhaps in closing, let's um, have a final round, and I uh, would invite each of you to respond to what is perhaps an unfair question, right? Um, let's assume we um, meet again at the Thomas Mann House in, in five years, mm -hmm. and um, we have a follow-up to this conference, to the symposium. Um, do you think that we would discuss similar topics or would there be different topics? What would be your greatest hope um, or your greatest fear in the run-up for such a symposium? I know it's an unfair question, but um, Christine, you said we should take more risks. And, and, and soon here, you said we should break down these silos. Um, you made very good su suggestion, Andreas, when it comes to upscaling. And uh, I know you thought about homophily uh, tendencies a lot. Um, um, Klaus suggested that we should look at history and probably be a bit more relaxed as to the modern times because we've been there all the way, right? more or less. Um, so let's have a free-floating exchange of ideas. And um, uh, since Christine went first, we should not put her on the spot again. <laughs> and uh, perhaps, uh, yeah. Sunil, would you like to go first? All right. Um, so interesting question. And I think... Um, Taking several uh, years into our perspective, we see that there are phases in mankind where trust is higher and where trust is mm. lower. And I think um, we live in a time where everything is changing and uh, where it is hard um, 
yeah, or, or where we have a lot of mistrust. And uh, I really hope that in five years we have the valley of the mistrust mm. <laughs> past <laughs> and we are climbing up again <laughs> in a future where uh, the, the, the trust is uh, more than the mistrust. Excellent. Uh, Klaus, would you mm. second that? Mm. No. <laughs> I mean, this is perhaps more response to, to Andreas and no. uh, uh, yes, and mentioning Anthony Giddens. I mean, uh, Giddens, if I remember that correctly, mentioned what were the sources of trust in pre-modernity. This were kinship, uh, local communities, religion and tradition. Mm -hmm. And these were all cut off in modernity uh, and were scaled up to every kind of connection which mm -hmm. is not biological, uh, you move to another mm -hmm. place here. To, so mm -hmm. this is, and modernity itself dealt with the scaling problem by introducing or secularizing the concept of trust. Mm -hmm. uh, so this would be Luhmann's answer, for example. Okay. So it's a relief from the enormous, mm. huge, overwhelming communication that is produced when you cut off kinship, local communities, religion, mm -hmm. and tradition. But this process took a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying At that five years that won't make much of a difference. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, I, th I think from a point of the history of the digital age, mm. we're following the discursive pathways from the 1960s. Most of the digitalization discourse in politics is still Cold War in a way, mm. or the basic arguments mm. come mm. from the Cold War. Mm. So I think five years might be not enough. But you would then <laughs> hope that we have a, a, a change in the discourse, the way we talk about cultural issues? Yes, I think so. Mm -hmm. I cannot expect it. It's but I think it's fundamentally changed. Okay. Yeah. I think Andrew's. we are accelerating. Uh, but mm -hmm. I don't think we are still in the Cold War. <laughs> um, um, because after, after uh, 1990, 1989, mm -hmm. 1990, we, we lived in the uh, age of uh, the end of the world, right? And, end uh, of history. Was end of history. history. Sorry. Yeah. End of, oh, oh okay, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> the end of history. But the end of history has ended now. Mm -hmm. and, and we are mm -hmm. entering a new age. So, um, as opposed to what we are discussing today in five years, uh, I'm optimistic. Um, and staying at the Thomas Mann House contributes to this. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I, be I believe we have to, and that's why we will succeed, mm -hmm. we have to make sure that uh, we build those bridges we uh, need so, uh, so dearly. Um, uh, and build those alliances uh, between, uh, yeah, unlikely uh, uh, people, uh, uh, unlikely bedfellows, mm -hmm. let's say, um, people who fundamentally disagree and who are not comfortable with uh, working together, but at the same time um, embracing the rule of law um, and uh, embracing facts and 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 trying to find the right solution for society for coming from different perspectives. And that's really what, what we need to accomplish. Stop factionalism. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and um, then again, this conference had, had also a focus on marginalized groups. Mm -hmm. And for this, I hope that we don't create digital ghettos, but instead help marginalized groups to become part of the mainstream discourse. And uh, I think there, there, there can be strategies to do this, and, but support the people to, to, be, to become part of the mainstream discord. I mean, they can have their communities. And mm -hmm. That's all fine, but it shouldn't stop there. We, we need to open this up. Yeah. So but two, um, two um, slightly positive um, uh, yeah. assessments, one more hesitant. And Christine, how do you come up? Uh, I must say I come up pessimistic. I have no optimism. And then we have balance. Uh, and I think uh, in five years, if we discuss again about trust or mistrust and the loss of trust, we will discuss this on the level of international politics. Mm. And uh, what is coming back is a, the, as a result of what is happening in Ukraine, at the moment will be a, a huge amount of mistrust, loss of trust in the international area. Mm. 
<clears throat> so we will perhaps not go back into the Cold War because history doesn't repeat that what Koselek always teaches us. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there will be a new uh, wave of international mistrust, which is a tragedy. We see it already, Then we, what now is discussed, how much more weapons we need, how we need sort of this industry of having more money in this area. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we will discuss in five years uh, this subject of international trust or mistrust, what this has done in the meantime, and I'm pessimistic. But are you also pessimistic when it comes to, let's say, more domestic uh, aspects that uh, Andreas, for example? Uh, well, I would say if we see it uh, isolated, but we can't see the world nowadays isolated. It yeah. might be that we have this wonderful, which I really like, uh, European Conference on the Future of Europe and that we have all this deliberation in the United States. But what is important nowadays is the interdependence interdependence uh, between the continents. And uh, so I might be optimistic that on uh, an American national level and on a European level, uh, that there will be more citizen participation. I'm convinced this is now, this has started. You can't put it back into the bottle. You so have to see how to shape this in a good way. But important is the interdependence. And I think here we have a loss of trust. We will experience a loss of trust. And this is not, good, not a good direction. Mm -hmm. So we have, um, I would say, you have a positive and a more negative side to it. So on, on balance, I think we're kind of mixed the way we come out. And uh, we should probably talk to the, uh, the Thomas Mannhaus in five years and have you all come back and then share okay. our views. But, uh, thank you so yeah. much. But, uh, <laughs> let, let me thank you for um, you know, a, a good discussion and uh, I wish you a good day.